is the Appalachian Trail. It's more than 2,000 miles long and crosses 13 states, from Springer Mountain in Georgia to Mount Katahdin in Maine. Those who attempt to hike the whole thing in one season are called thru-hikers. They say that an AT thru-hike is the equivalent in elevation change of ascending and descending Mount Everest 15 times. And last year, it took me six months and roughly five million steps to complete. <laughs> While the physical ups and downs are certainly challenging, the truth is it's the psychological ups and downs that make up the real roller coaster. Every day brings soaring emotional highs and a dozen new reasons to quit. One moment you have never felt so empowered, authentic, grounded, and free. The next, you're trapped on a ridge in a lightning storm, running blindly through a flash flood while holding metal trucking poles, praying it's not really true that lightning seeks a moving target. <laughs> you endure eight straight days of rain. And just when you start to think that gray is the only color that's ever existed, on the ninth day you wake up to the glorious warmth of the sun on your face. Intense highs and bottomless lows punctuate long stretches of repetition, boredom, exhaustion, and ever-present pain. Of the thousands of hopefuls who set off from Springer each year, more than four out of five will quit before they get halfway. There are three types of quitters. Those who quit right away, because it's not what they were expecting. Those who quit when they get their first injury, and those who endure their first injury and forge on, only to quit when they get hurt a second time because the novelty of suffering has worn off. <laughs> you learn really fast that nothing entitles you to being a through hiker. It's not enough to just show up. You have to dig deep inside yourself to find the strength to take each and every one of those five million steps. And unlike many other paths in life, no one is waiting at the end to give you a high five or a diploma. But the really liberating part is that everything you need is right there on your back. Home is all around you. And you are the only one who has to live with your decisions. And what you realize sooner or later is that there are as many ways to hike the AT as there are people on this earth, which means that no one else has the right or the ability to tell you that you're doing it wrong. But when they try, which they will, you can always say, dude, hike your own hike. <laughs> <laughs> this is the golden rule of the AT. You've got to hike your own hike. By virtue of being out there, through hikers have given themselves this permission. The permission to invest in themselves, to rely on themselves, to make their own rules, and to go in pursuit of their fulfillment and growth. Of course, when you dare to hike your own hike, the day will come when you suddenly can't. When you've twisted your ankle, not once, but twice, in the exact same way, both times, so bad, it made noises. And you don't know what else to do because it's too steep to pitch your tent, so you just sit down in the middle of the trail and cry because you're hurt and far away from anyone who cares. This happened to me barely 200 miles in, and I have never felt so alone. But when you are pursuing the mountains that call to you, not because others have said they're the right ones to climb, but because they feel profoundly yours, you will find yourself surrounded by people you thought were strangers, but who are, in fact, part of your tribe. And on the day when you most need their help, these are the people who will discover you, wrap your ankle in their ace bandage, leave you alone when you sheepishly ask to be left alone, then hike down to camp and drop their packs and turn and run the two miles back uphill so that they can carry your pack for you. These are the people who will give you not one, 
but both of the Snickers bars that they carried 40 miles out of town. Because your mountains are their mountains too, and they can see that you need it. If not for these people who were also daring to hike their own hike, I would have quit before I even reached the Smokies. Instead, I was so awed and humbled by all that they gave me. The next morning, I limped the 11 miles into town alone, <laughs> took a day to recover, and forged on ahead. Now, the other people that you encounter on a through hike are townspeople, who often have no idea what you're doing or why you smell so bad. <laughs> and sometimes they find your story so inspiring that they go out of their way to help you. Other times, seeing that you're living out of a backpack with no car for getting places, they just assume you're homeless. <laughs> but we prefer the term home free. Um, there are exceptions, but for the most part, everybody asks the same five or six questions. Like, where does it start? And where do you get food? And how many miles a day do you hike? And then, when their curiosity is satisfied, most people arrive at this place, which is not a question. It's a statement. And the statement is, well, I could never do that. And at first, it's a cool thing to hear because it makes you feel special. But after a few dozen times, you just want to shake them. You just want to say, it's not that you can't. Hiking is walking. You know how to walk. It's not that you can't, it's that you just don't want to. You don't want to take six months out of your life to walk across the country, and that's okay. Something else is more important to you. Maybe you have a family, or maybe you like to bathe every day. But let's be clear, it's not an issue of capacity. It's an issue of priorities. And the thing about priorities is that there's only room for so many. And the hardest part is figuring out what they are. Once you decide, the rest is easy. Every day for six months when I woke up, I didn't waste any time or energy wondering what I wanted to do that day or doubting the direction I'd chosen the day before. My only purpose was to hike. My only direction was north. And every time I looked up at that mountain and wanted to quit, I asked myself, well, how bad do you want it? And each time, I remember that I didn't just kind of want it. I wanted it really bad. Bad enough to tear my gaze away from that summit and look for that next step, and the next one, and the next one. I did that so many times that eventually when I looked up again, I didn't see the mountain because it was underneath me. And suddenly, I was standing on top of Katahdin, gazing back at the country I had just crossed by foot. And I thought, this is how impossible things become possible. By breaking them down into five million steps and wanting it bad enough to take just one more. At that moment, I knew that humans are capable of so much more than we dare to imagine. And I knew I had to find the next 2,000 mile goal which didn't exist yet, because I had to create it. But what I didn't know is that my course was about to collide with the mountains my mom had been climbing for the past seven years. The first time I came face to face with my mountains, I was with my father. While he was dying in a hospital bed. He'd been admitted for surgery on his neck, but the cause of death was a ruptured colon, and three words that should be an oxymoron hospital-acquired infection. I did some thinking about that, and I couldn't wrap my head around the fact that it was the very thing designed to save him that had brought about his death. And then I did some research, and I found that hundreds of people die every single day in this country of infections they get in hospitals. And hundreds more die every day of other kinds of unintended medical harm. And I thought, people really need to know about this stuff. They need to know how and why it happens so that they can be proactive and help to take care of their families so things will work out well. I had found my mountains, and I began to climb. I began by helping to pass a state law that required hospitals in my state to disclose their infection rates. 
And that quickly morphed into a world of meetings and conferences and summits and uh, all kinds of events that I would go to. And all of them, at all of them, I would ask, what are the simple solutions? What are you looking to do that will respect and use the power and the capacity of patients and families to contribute? And wherever I saw gaps, I did the best I could to fill them. Along the way, I met some wonderful health advocates, doctors and nurses and people in the healthcare that were wonderful allies, and also patient advocates that were so passionate, and they inspired me to keep going. But I also pushed up against a culture of healthcare that was resistant to change, and powerful special interests that have a vested interest in keeping things the way they were and maintaining their lucrative turf. And I spent a ridiculous amount of time every day thinking about and talking about and writing about and blogging about and reading about patient engagement. Which, by the way, is probably one of the sexiest topics to bring up at a dinner party. <laughs> and I see how people are responding to me and I think, yeah, I know what you're thinking, that medical harm thing, yeah, that's what happens to other people. And I wonder why on earth I chose such impossible mountains. And sometimes it's really hard to keep on taking steps. And then one day last spring, my daughter told me that she had some pain in her back and some tingling and numbness in her hands and feet. And four days later, she woke up in so much pain that she couldn't get out of bed. And it was a Saturday. Of course, these things happen on a Saturday. And I thought, well, this is kind of serious, and I don't think I should just go into the emergency room on a weekend. So I reached out to Dr. Lowe, who was one of those healthcare allies I'd met along the way. And he actually took my cell phone call, which shocked me on a Saturday. And um, he listened calmly to, as I described Jess's symptoms. And he said, okay, um, I'm gonna set up a battery of diagnostic tests so that when she gets to the emergency room, it'll all be waiting for her. And then I'm gonna go get a couple of hours sleep because I just came home from an overnight in the hospital. And then I'm gonna come back to the hospital and meet you there and review the tests with you. So that was pretty great. And the working diagnosis was maybe Lyme disease or some kind of infection. But the diagnosis when it came was something called Guillain-Barre syndrome, or GBS, which is a rare and paralyzing autoimmune disease. And it's so rare and so often missed by doctors with less experience that when we got to the next hospital that night, at first they didn't believe that the diagnosis was right. So they took a while to figure that out. But then, think about this, if Dr. Lowe hadn't gotten involved with this that day, what are the odds that Jess would be, not only have had the correct diagnosis, but was already in treatment that very night, inside of what turned out to be a critical window? Now, you may think that that's totally extraordinary, and it is, absolutely it is. But the fact is that Dr. Lowe has done this kind of thing for hundreds of families in the course of his career because these are the mountains that he chose years ago when he began his career. And his mission is to save every life he can. And if I had not been walking this path for the past seven years, Dr. Law would not be in my life. Already I was grateful, but my daughter was in a lot of trouble. Guillain-Barre syndrome, what happens is the immune system attacks the nerves and the paralysis moves from the hands and feet to the arms and legs, and then in one out of three patients it moves to the chest and they can't breathe. And they have to go on a breathing tube in intensive care, sometimes for months, and sometimes they die. Um, and I remember that night watching as my daughter was dozing and I'm thinking, I can't believe this is happening to my baby girl. She'd always been so strong and so independent. And she'd, um, she'd cut her own hair when she was five. She, she um, crashed her first car when she was 15. <laughs> no, she didn't have a permit. And um, she set off for India with a backpack when she graduated college. She was so full of life. And in the days that followed, she lost most of her ability to walk. 
And then the paralysis impacted her swallowing, and then it reached her face, and she couldn't smile. And I remember um, massaging her numb legs and feet and looking it up at her, at her and saying, it's okay, everything's gonna be okay. And then I'd leave the room to take a phone call from a friend and I'd completely lose it. And I had to focus on what I had learned since my father's death, that good outcomes can hinge on the patient and family stepping up and engaging in their care. So we began with the nurses, and we had some wonderful nurses, but I know that in the staff rotations and the gaps and glitches that happen with staff, uh, with handoffs and care, that we were the only constant. So we stayed with Jess all day and all night, and we gathered research and input from my network all over the world, and we Googled everything, we wrote everything down, and we distilled what we learned and looked for disconnects, and. We, we would make sure that the questions and the materials we brought to our medical team would be helpful and maybe something they hadn't seen before, but showed with respect. And they responded by stepping up their game. They um, did more research. They asked for our input when it was time to make a decision. There was a time when communication was falling through the cracks and one wonderful nurse, Lisa, called a team meeting and um, got everybody on the same page. Then there was a day when we just had a lot of pain and she needed her pain medication and it was late and she was off the procedures. And the director of radiology took it upon himself to wheel her gurney from one treatment area to the other to help speed things along. We were a team and we were helping each other. And it's impossible for us to know how much our engagement or theirs impacted the outcome. But there is a hospital study of GBS patients with Jess's exact treatment protocol. And the average hospital stay is 23.1 days. That's the hospital stay, 23.1 days. Jess was out in seven. And two weeks later, I took some video of her at home. Within a span. Hello? Can you hear me? Within a span of days, I'd gone from peak physical condition to being too weak to take my own socks off. In a word, it was surreal. <laughs> and there were days I wanted to look up at that enormity of the climb in front of me and sink into despair. But I knew in some ways that these mountains were no different from the ones I climbed less than a year before. And I knew that, I mean, they said it would take six months. And like the AT, these were psychological challenges as much as physical ones. And I knew I had to tear my gaze away from that summit and focus on taking that next step. So I let everything else go. I accepted where I was, committed to being present, and focused on doing on only what I could do now. Every day I woke up and went north. And by paying careful attention to the here and now, I was able to dwell in a place of profound appreciation, sharing countless moments of resonant gratitude with my family and witnessing those small bits of evidence that constitute healing and magic. When I told my neurologist that I would be the outlier, she insisted I should keep my expectations realistic. What I heard was, I could never do that. I can't even describe what it felt like um, three months after this whole thing happened to take this video. Riding the bike trail, helmet on, <laughs> but look at that. And this was, as I said, three months after this all began. Less than half the time that the doctors insisted that it would take. And by the way, she had danced at her cousin's wedding in the days before that. So one reporter who heard this called it a miracle. And if you call it that, you are eclipsing the whole reason we're here tonight, which is to ask, why do we climb mountains? And it's because every experience from the most beautiful sunrise to the pain of loss teaches us something. 
And because somewhere up there are people climbing their mountains, the human connections that could someday change your life. These are the unforeseen gifts that, that are possible for ourselves and for others when we choose a path and just start walking. No matter what form your mountains take, remember that you don't have to climb them all at once. Remember that even the most impossible things are achieved one step at a time. <laughs> you can't hike your own hike without meeting others who are daring to do the same. You can't take five million steps without meeting others, wait, without crossing someone else's path. And it's at these intersections, which we can never predict or anticipate, where magic happens. So here's to everyone who dares to take that next step. Thank you.